Okay, I'm carving a pocket spoon, and I thought you guys might like to see me talk about how I do what I do with it. Uh, first thing to say about a pocket spoon is that um, because there's no neck, or because the neck is as wide as the widest part of the bowl, what I find to be the most essential thing is to draw a really nice bowl first. And so I would say the, the first thing you want to do if you're trying to carve a pocket spoon is just practice drawing bowls. Just draw them and draw them and draw them and draw them until you have like a sweet shape that you can just draw <clears throat> right off the bat. Uh, because that's going to be essential to establishing everything else about the pocket spoon. There's not a lot else going on. So um, for me, I, I, I really like the way a classic egg-shaped bowl works. Um, if you if you narrow it too much here, it, it just looks, I don't know. There's lots of ways to do it. But for me, having a, a beautiful egg shape is the place that I start. And then right at the widest point here and here, I just draw a, a nicely tapered handle down. Now, because mine are designed to fit in a pocket, they're a little shorter than you would do. You know, if I was doing an eating spoon, I'd maybe add an inch. Um, uh, and then, and of course, all of this is done on a piece of wood that already has the crank carved into it. Um, and then you see that I've left myself enough room in this rim um, to be able to exaggerate that crank a little bit further if I want to. Um, and also, I've left enough room here to be able to put a, a swoop the other way in the handle um, so that everything is sort of swooping down into the middle. Um, and then on the back, I've just established a middle facet and then facets on either side. Um, and on mine, I, I just tend to like the feel of having three facets running down the back of the handle. And then um, I'll do the bowl different ways, depending. So axing it out is really simple because there's no neck to worry about. So you basically just saw it to length and then and away you go. Um, doesn't take very long. And... The order of operations is the same as I do for my other spoons in that I carve the outline um, the rough outline that I've drawn first and I would say the biggest problem I've had with pocket spoons is discovering some sort of discovering some sort of crack or problem with the wood way through carving because unlike other spoons it's just because they're so symmetrical and the form is so precise there's nowhere there's really only sort of one form that works it's hard to size them down or tweak them in ways that you can tweak with with more conventional spoon shapes to get around flaws in the wood um, and with the pocket spoon you, you know there's, there's much less wiggle room essentially the other thing that's tricky about them is because there's no neck, it makes it harder to hold on to at times. It makes me realize how much I, I tend to hook my fingers around the neck like this, but it doesn't work the same when it's like this. Um, as always, guys, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Here's an interesting cut that is nice on a handle that's tapering this way. is to actually just brace your knife against your chest and then pull out. And you actually have more control and you can see what you're doing better than if you were trying to do a an actual push with a knife like this. So again, it's just holding it braced in tight to my body so it can't move. And then I'm pulling the, and it's maybe angled slightly so that there's a natural sort of slide of the blade along the, the wood, as opposed to being straight up and down, in which case I'm using it just, you know, pushing like a, um, like a chisel wood. But instead if it's skewed slightly, then I can get a longer, cleaner cut. So, okay, there's one side. And then, similarly, I can't do the same for this other side, but what I can do is I can, um, let's move it back so you guys can see. I can brace my forearm um, on my knee like this and um, pull back. And that similarly allows me to see what I'm doing. So you can see it doesn't take very long to get the outline. Uh, and then the trick is to get the top of the handle exactly how you want. Now the reason I like to have a 
call it a tail flip at the end here, is because there's so little definition to this handle, having a swoop down that sort of conforms to your thumb helps keep your thumb positioned back here, which makes the most of the length that you do have, because it's fairly short, designed to fit into your pocket nicely. Um, and so part of why this is so deep, I don't normally need this, is so that I can, I can increase the, the crank if I want to. But all of that flows from the tip of the handle. You gotta make sure the tip of the handle is the way you want it. Now, as you get down to this neck, um, the cut's gonna get harder because you're asking your knife to cut across a whole bunch of wood at once. Um, and the trick is to have a nice sharp knife and then also to um, make sure that you're angled this down within the grain so that it's your, your blade is just very cleanly cutting the wood and not trying to figure out if it's cutting it or splitting it at all. But by angling this down into the wood enough, you basically make it so that that cut is more likely to be clean. And by keeping that cut clean, you make it an easier cut to execute. So you'll notice I didn't try and break it all off because now I'm down in a valley here. So now I need to come at it from the other direction. Hey everyone. Um, so first let's look and see if there's any wiggle within this blank and it looks like this side is going to need to come down a little bit. So I'll do the low side first so I know sort of what I'm trying to match that high side down to. Um, and here's where sort of understanding how you want the side rail of the spoon to be is important because um, what I think is really valuable to think about is <clears throat> Instead of doing a spoon where uh, the crank happens somewhere down in here and, and end up sort of pushing it up from that point, thinking about the crank is happening right in here and then having the, the bowl be at one angle and the handle be at another angle um, allows you to make a sweep curve in here that then dips down lower. So the lowest point of this curve on the side is, is actually right back where the neck on the spoon would actually be. Um, and that's particularly important in this style spoon where otherwise all that material on the side would get in the way. Um, so there's a couple different ways you could handle it. You could allow this side of the top of the handle to be sloped down or not. I find it, it just flows better if I allow it to be sloped down. But then whether you have it meet in a center spine or whether you keep this center nice and uh, flat and you just pull this up in a facet on the side that's just a matter of sort of what you want to do um, but at any rate having your you sort of a, a nice gentle curve that meets its lowest point right here at the where the the back the very back of the bowl is means that you the bowl of your spoon itself is uh, basically flat with a very gentle catenary to it um, okay, so here's the hard part with this spoon is where I would normally hold it. Well, actually, hold on. So normally I hold my spoons like this, and I always thought, oh, I can't do that with a spoon. But let me just see if I can. Yeah, it's a bit more awkward. But I think it's better than the alternative. Trying to do this bit of the, the front tip here without that cut is just, it's, it's awkward. You're doing something funny like this. So um, and now once I round that corner, pull that around and you can see how that cut that jammed up here in the middle, once I uh, come at it from the other direction, it's very happy to come out as a clean cut here. So at this point I've cleaned that up and I might as well come at this from the other direction as well. Let's get that nice and clean. All right, so where the back of the bowl is on these is the critical thing to sort of maintain and figure out um, because I've found that it's easy to make the back of the bowl uh, both too shallow and also too deep. Um, and so finding that middle ground again when you don't have the visual cue of where the shoulders are is, is tricky. Um, but now that we've got this top face done, 
and it's not perfectly symmetrical. We'll clean that up with a pencil later. Now it's time, uh, once we have these, yeah, there we go. Once we have these side curves the way that we think we want them to get a nice eating experience, right? Um, yeah, that feels like it's got the right amount. So now we're gonna pull up the back. Um, and just trying to be aware of the symmetricality of the bottom so I don't skew it to one side or the other. Yeah, miso soup spoon. Yeah, you know, I saw this really interesting miso soup spoon the other day that had a, uh, it have? It had like a, like a hook coming off this way. So the, the top of the handle came out and then hooked around so that if this was the rim of the bowl, it could hook um, on the inside and you would rest the, the bowl, the spoon down inside the bowl and it would, this hook here would hook over the rim. And that was, it was really cool. It was just like a built-in integral part of the handle. Um, ultimately, I didn't see why you couldn't just let your spoon rest on the edge of the bowl. Um, but at any rate, it was cool enough that I took a picture of it and thought about it for a little while. But it's also maybe a good example of how, you know, a really clever solution is maybe uh, too clever at times. And a lot of times, the simpler something is, the, the better and more universal it is. That's certainly my design philosophy, I guess, in a nutshell. Okay. Okay, so now I've pulled the back of the bowl. up to about where I want it. Okay. And then, and then that part goes up your nose. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, okay, so now I've pulled up the back of the bowl, so. Now I want to make sure that these cuts that I'm doing here end up symmetrical, right? So that they're creating a flat surface on the bottom that matches the flat surface on the top. Um, and I've got my middle one. And now I'll do the one on either side. Now, uh, I've learned that at this stage of the week, this knife that I'm using has done so much carving at this point of the week that it's not producing the cleanest cut that I can get. So before I do my finishing cuts, I'm gonna switch to my other knife, even though I usually switch to it to do all the fiddly bits in around the neck, and this one has no fiddly bits. It's still producing a, that other one is still producing a, a cleaner cut than this one is. Okay, so there we are. We've got this, we've got this. How does this feel in the hand? It feels pretty good. Um, you know, I might decide to push this down even further. You, you know, you'd be shocked at how, uh, how little depth you need to a bowl if the bowl is properly hollowed out and properly angled to get it to both hold quite a lot and feel quite spacious. So given the, you know, pocket spoon you want to ride in your pocket with minimum amount of space taken up and sort of profile there in your pocket. Um, it's useful to pay attention to that. Okay, see how when I'm working in close to my body like this, um, I've got my hand basically braced right up here on my chest so that knife can't ever hit me. Um, now, if this weren't such a straight line, I'd be doing this as a thumb push. Um, because when you just do it freehand like that, you have not nearly as much control. Um, but because I'm, it's such a straight line, it just doesn't take very long. Okay. Hold up my rim all the way around so I can do a nice, beautiful curved cut around it. Put the rim on 
this side. Now I'm ready to um, draw the lines. Anyone have any questions so far? So here we are, we've got the crank, we've got the bottom of the bowl. Um, I might exaggerate this crank even further, we'll see. Um, but there's going to be an opportunity to do that once I draw the line and recut the shape. So you see how this is uh, sticking out more on this side. So whatever I do has to conform within this side. So I'll start there first. And, you know, part of the trick with these spoons is to be able to visualize the bowl within that super wide neck. So. I always basically try and redraw, just pretend that this is a billet of wood that I've just done the crank on and just I'm drawing a fresh bowl um, rather than try and overthink it and think too hard about it. I'm just drawing a fresh bowl like that. Um, so, and then that allows me to pull in this side just a, just a fraction. Um, which would remove that wide shoulder. And, yep, okay, that's good. And then I have to decide if I wanna keep this, I'm gonna wanna shorten the handle just a smidge um, because I'd, I would rather have the handle be a little uh, wider and stubbier, given that it is a pocket spoon. So I'm gonna reduce the handle to that lower one. I tried the upper one. Um, how many times on average do I draw the design? I basically draw the design twice, Sean. I, I draw it um, with pen or Sharpie when I've axed in the crank, but before I've done anything else, uh, I, I draw it there. And that's what I saw to and, and carved to with the ax. And then I draw it here with pencil. Um, and then that's it. Uh, should just be those two times. Okay, so now I'm switching knives. So, um, carving right to that line. Now, one of the things that's visually difficult to keep in mind is that when you draw this line here, um, this line, we are used to thinking of this line as serving as the outside of the bowl. But down here, it's actually serving as the inside of the bowl, the inside edge of the bowl, right? There is no outside of the bowl. That would be a little bit lower. So um, the trick I found is to stay just a, just a, sh whatever my rim size is going to be, I just stay just a tiny bit proud of that. And that keeps it from getting, feeling too fat down here for how it is up here. It, it sort of calibrates for that. Sean, the reason Sharpie first and pencil later... Well, Sharpie writes on um, wood that's pretty damp, so um, this cherry, even though it's been sitting around for a year, is still pretty acting pretty fresh. Um, and um, and particularly the sapwood, uh, but but really, um, depending on the type of wood, I, I actually prefer a big pen. Um, but I don't have a big pen in my pocket right now, so this happened to be the green Sharpie that I had in my pocket. And then pencil later because I, I, uh, the pencil later is basically because I don't want something that's going to leave a mark that's going to potentially stain the wood once I've gotten down to those finished surfaces. And I do, I will say, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of the Sharpie and how it, sometimes you get Sharpie on your hand and you gotta be aware of that. Uh, on the other hand, I don't like how the big pen sort of keeps stopping working on the wet wood and then you get it right on your hand to do that. So there's no perfect solution, although there's probably some pencil that, you know, will write on anything and it's, it's amazing, but I don't have it. Uh, and if I did have one, I'd probably lose it. So uh, this is just me coming up with the, uh, you know, sort of, Best case scenario. Um, okay, so now, so you see how by carving just proud of that line, I end up basically as 
treating that line that I drew as the inside line. Um, and now, so I'll trim this end here. Okay, and now this is my chance to, if I want to exaggerate this crank anymore, now's my chance to do so. Um, and I guess, why not? I might as well, it's not, well, I do think that it's possible for spoons to have too much crank. This spoon is certainly not one of them. So let's push that crank down a little more by exaggerating the swoop, but again, having the low point of the swoop be right here uh, back at the neck. So what I'm doing is more creating more of a tilt rather than creating more of a deep swoop. I want to have that adjustment be shallower up at the tip of the bowl and then push deeper and deeper as I get down to what's going to be the lowest point so that I end up with a rim that is tilted rather than more deeply pulled out. Graphite pencils you think work or alcohol-based pens? I don't think I've ever heard of an alcohol-based pen. All right, so now... Um, uh, okay, so now I'm pushing this swoop down, and, and by looking down at it, I can tell whether I've got equal amounts of crank, which I'm going to go just a smidge more. Okay. And now, this might be an exception, Sean. Um, right here, I'm going to redraw that line that I took out just to make it easier for me when I come in with the hook knife to get the line that I wanted. Ah, but here's a great example. On these pocket spoons, because there's so much meat here, it's easy to overdo it and push the line too far that way. So you see that one. It's too far over. I misjudged it, and now I drew the true line, which is the line closer to my finger there. Um, I'm not sure what, what part of what I just said was heresy, uh, but probably a lot of what I say is heresy. Okay, redraw the shape, and you'll see that I didn't push the shape all the way out to the edge because remember I'm going to be that's the inside curve that I'm doing and then I have to leave room for the rim along there um, uh, okay now I'm just gonna pull down the sides of here and I think on this one maybe I'll do sort of a gentle curve from side to side on the top of the handle while at the same time maintaining its, its sort of uh, upswept thing going on. Um, that does seem to be the most natural way to pull the curvature of sort of naturally exiting the, the widest part of the bowl here. Um, and the fact that the bowl naturally wants to go up in the middle, you just sort of mirror that in the camber of the handle. Uh, only dragged away, so yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, I know you're giving me a hard time. I just couldn't remember what it was about because I'm talking too much here. Um, okay. All right, good. So now I've got an even amount of depth on the sides there. And I've got basically a nice clean surface to the whole top of this handle. That's also key. And that was the hardest thing when I first started doing these was getting that surface, getting such a wide surface to be, you know, a smooth shape and free of blemishes, essentially. Uh, okay, so now I'm just going to adjust the bottom and adjusting the bottom really has more to do with your innate sense of how deep a spoon needs to be so if you have another eating spoon I would suggest putting it side by side um, and you'll probably be surprised at how shallow an eating spoon truly is I think we all have a tendency to 
make them deeper if we're just sort of, the, the thing about a pocket spoon is that it's, it's missing a lot of the cues um, because that neck makes it confusing. So it's all the cues of sort of how the proportions of things are, are, are missing because that neck is getting in there and getting in the way of how we tend to calibrate something. And I found that the tendency is to make something that is overly large. Now, um, yeah, sometimes I decide to keep three facets, but in this case, maybe I will because these are three pretty nice facets here. Um, hey, Mike. Um, so, okay, so now hold them down the back. So you can see one of the things that makes these pocket spoons simple and quick to make is that with no fiddling around with the neck and a pretty simple form that's easy to get symmetrical um, it's just not a lot that needs to be done with them which is nice um, okay so now I'm just paying attention to that line on the underside and how thick to make the handle etc is you know, largely a matter of taste and how it feels when it's in your hand. Um, I'm sure this is a great example of, there are some variables in my spoons that hold remarkably consistent from, from spoon to spoon, even, you know, within the same type of spoon. Um, while there are other variables that change around almost with every spoon. And I suspect that the depth of this underside is one that will change around um, more so than other variables because um, depending on the angle and depending on the facets and depending on the proportions different depths could feel more or less appropriate and there are things you could do in terms of making this facet be perfectly tapered or in this case, you see how there's a subtle curve to this one, which I'll probably try and mimic on this side. That just happened, but let's roll with it. Um, so that's the sort of thing where um, you just kind of have a bunch of arrows in your quiver and pay attention to what's happening and do your best to respond in kind. Try to get this curve to match on the other side while also maintaining this as a surface that has a consistent depth to this rim that I'm creating here. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, okay, now I'm just gonna trim the top. Sometimes I do the top totally flat, sometimes I do the top in a curve. This one feels good to do it in a curve. That's what I'll do. I'll probably just do the tiniest of chamfers. Um, yesterday we talked about how to how to walk away and be done, and uh, this is a great example of how in my process I try and do things in a certain order, so that once they're done, they're done, and I can get them to the place that they need to be to be done, and then then be, then not have to revisit it. So here I am putting the finishing little chamfers on the handle so that I don't have to come back to it. Okay, so finishing chamfers on the underside of the rim. Just make sure that rim is a nice, even, delicate thickness. Now, even though it's a pocket spoon, you can go fairly delicate on that rim. You just can't go too delicate. So as with everything, there's a little ground. That's good. Okay, all right, so that's where we are. Nice crank, nice even facets, smooth faces, everything's chamfered. Um, and it's time to do knife. Anyone have any questions? This is gonna go pretty quick here.
Okay, do my customary line of cuts down the middle into the center. Flip it around. Now, doing the bowls on these spoons is a bit more awkward than doing bowls on regular spoons. I can't quite put my finger on why yet. It doesn't have to do necessarily with your ability to hold it. It has more to do with... I don't know what it has to do with. For some reason, they're, just, they're always a little more awkward to do the bowl of these. Um, but same rules apply. Start in the middle, work your way out and down at equal pace. I think this is what's awkward, is um, I'm used to putting my, uh, <laughs> did you guys see Will in the background? I'm used to putting my thumb on the, the back of the shoulder here to serve in opposition to carving. Oh yeah, it's actually this thumb, right? And I can't really do that here. There's nothing, there's nothing to hold on to. So that's part of what's awkward, that when I'm doing these cuts, it's like my thumb keeps wanting to slip up, um, which feels potentially dangerous. So um, I think what I do instead is I, I sort of push it into my palm like this, and really I'm sort of pushing into my palm the whole time to get some good friction, and then I'm taking gentler cuts. So it takes a little bit longer, and the whole thing is shifting around a little bit more. Um, but then once I achieve the, the more of the bowl shape on the inside, then the knife starts conforming to that shape and things stabilize a little bit. It's just at the beginning where, in particular, it's just awkward up in here to make these cuts up here because there's no shoulder to brace my thumb against. Um, so you can see how I'm sort of just sort of clutching the whole thing in my hand. There we go, all the way down. Now remember, there's, I mean, it's not that you have just one shot, but really, if you wanna sort of leave this form alone and do the bowl and be done, you got one shot to get up to that line and not mess it up. So really work your way up to that line slowly, and carefully, and make sure that the depth of the bowl is progressing as well so that you don't need to put more pressure on the whole spoon than you need to as you get deep into that. And my cuts, as always, are a combination of going across like this, doing sweeps with the, the back of the blade, and then doing sweeps with the tip of the blade. Um, and it just depends on where I'm at and what I think is going to work better. Sometimes I use the curvature of the blade to create the curvature of the inside rim, particularly right there. And sometimes I sweep the blade to create curvature on the rim. Okay. So as I'm working my way down the rim here, uh, sort of create overlapping strokes where I'll go one and then come down and go out to the rim again and then another overlap, another overlap. But that will leave me with a little bit of a scallop on the rim here. Um, uh, and um, so part of how I'm going to clean that up is when I come back the other direction, I'll be able to sweep the tip of the knife along the edge of that inside curve and just get it to be one smooth curve. This thing that was previously a whole bunch of scallops. Um, my knife does cut like butter. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's a good knife, um, and I keep it sharp, and the wood is sort of optimal wood for this too. If, you know, I could be carving hard maple or walnut, and you would not be saying my, <laughs> my knife cuts like butter, but I'm carving, you know, beautiful clear, clear grain cherry, so, yep, sure is. Um... Okay, so now I'm paying attention to how it feels in the center of the bowl, and I can feel that particularly here, it's just a little too thick still. Um, so, the same way, uh, you know, I came down here and had sort of scallop, 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 so now I'm gonna 
clear it and by coming down this way. And that will allow me to ghost up to the rim and simultaneously clean up all those scallops. Um, so that's how you get the scallops out of the edge is by making those swirl cuts with either the tip of the blade or the heel of the blade. Um, or swirling around the edge. And then I want to make sure I push the bowl deep enough here in the back that it actually, that the spoon will actually hold a decent amount of stuff. Because if it would be possible to leave this back bit too shallow, in which case it wouldn't. Um, it, it wouldn't uh, hold nearly as much. What's your comment? Um, you don't get much of it in California, that's for sure. Um, certainly not in the in the large log form that we get it here. Um, out here, it's a forest species, and so it gets quite big. And if you can get your hands on one of those long, straight sections of trunk, even a wiggly section of trunk, but you know, branchless section that was grown in a forest. Oh man. That is the best. Um, okay, so now I'm... You see how um, not having the neck here does make it a little bit more awkward. Um, but not too bad. Now I have to be careful of this upper rim to make sure that it, I'm achieving a nice curve with it. That doesn't get too uh, sharp or too shallow. Um, and I also wanna make sure that the curve coming down from it into the hollow of the bowl is a true curve and doesn't have a, a bump in it. That's pretty easy to do also. Um, so sometimes that means starting your cut right up at the rim but not actually cutting in at the rim and only deepening your cut as you, as you go down. Um, that makes sense. Hope that makes sense. Okay, good. So you can see how now I've cleaned up this bit here. Um, there's no tool marks anywhere on this section here. So now I need to bring my tool marks down to it, sort of ghost up to it, because I can feel that the, the depth of the bowl here is just about right, the, the feel of it. Um, in terms of the thickness, it's just about right. So now I start to just make sure that the rim absolutely everywhere is exactly the way I want it. Swirling my knife around to get to all those spots on the rim. And then once the rim is totally the way I want it, and then I do again those cuts that sort of start right at the rim, but don't actually start cutting in until you get down below the level of the rim. And that's how you end up making cuts that will clean up all of those facets. If you want to clean it up, you don't, you know, it's, it's perfectly possible to make delightful bowls that show facets in the bowls. Um, it's just not how I'm challenging myself right now. Um, okay. And then once I've got bowl here. Good to go. There's always going to be some point of transition where cuts from one direction are going to meet cuts of the other direction. And that's where having a really sharp knife and being able to sort of swirl around is going to make it appear that you're going to basically try to use that effect to eliminate a lot of the tool marks that otherwise still exist. Yeah. There we go. Good. And like I said, never going to get it absolutely perfect. And sometimes you need to recognize when you're getting too close to thin and stop and walk away. But you know, the beauty of a knife finished spoon is that you're constantly pushing yourself to do more. Yeah, so um, 
I can, I always like to do a mouth test. And this one is telling me that I've gone plenty deep, but my rim, particularly on this side, is just a tiny bit too far in. So I need to widen it out as much as I can to get the feel to the bowl that I want. And I would say if you are carving spoons and you're not putting them in your mouth, you're missing out on whether your spoon actually feels good or not. And you're missing out on all that information that you could be getting. Um, because there's a lot of subtlety with what's going on. Let's see who's calling. the number okay so now that I've got the inside of the bowl I have as few knife marks as I can and I've tested the feel and adjusted the feel as well as I can um, the other thing that remains to be done are just the final chamfers around the bowl itself um, so I like to do the chamfer that's just on the inner edge with the hook knife itself because you don't run the risk of having it um, cut into the wood on the inside because the tip is naturally lifted up out of the way. And then... Good. Good. Okay. Okay, now, as with almost all of my spoons, I will go back around and clean up the outside edge now that I have a nice inside curve to match it to. Um, that's a trick I picked up from Derek Sanderson, um, and it works really nicely. It means that you don't have to fuss around trying to get a perfect curve right away and then match it with the, with the hook knife. You just do what the best you can with the hook knife and then match it once you have that visual cue of exactly what curve you're trying to, trying to hit. And I'm just, you know, I do this not by trying to recut the entire Thing by just bring it down just the tiniest little bits and then I do very subtle bevel down particularly of the front so I'm angled I'll actually make my angle a little more shallow as I reach the front. So I started out like this, and then I'm getting more like this as I reach the front of the tip because I want to sort of blend it into that bevel at the rim. And then I can see a little spot that's sticking up just a shade higher. Okay. Yep, and then uh, I'll probably take my knife and just knock down the tiniest little shaving. You can see how tiny that shaving is. It's the tiniest little shaving on that chamfer there so that it's not so sharp. Um, while burnishing would knock that down a little bit, it would pop back up and be a little bit too sharp if I didn't knock it down with a knife. Um, and then just feeling these other ones that go down the handle. I wonder if I should knock those down a little bit too. And then we're done. And voila. So that's the pocket spoon. As always, I'm going to burnish it. And then use my wax with a heat treatment. And 
And one thing I will say about the pocket spoon is, um, and this is true of almost all of my eating spoons, is that the, the bowl is the thickest right here. And then there's a gradual taper all the way to the rim. So that when you're pulling it out of your mouth, it gets easier and easier and easier and then just whoop, pops right out. Um, uh, yep, yeah. oh, and then a little, little tiny right here that didn't get eliminated. So I'll go back and I try not to open the can of worms by removing these pencil lines. Bob, what are you referring to? Uh, are you just trying to get with Roof Devon, Roof Devon UK? Is that something that you want me to check out? Or is that trying to get her attention? It's not clear to me. Um, okay. So any of you guys who are coming to the Spoonosaurus gathering, it's going to be cold. Make sure you bring plenty of warm clothes. Matt and I are going to be handling uh, lunches on Saturday and Sunday. I believe he's making chili and cornbread. I'm going to bring hot dogs with a lot of fixings for Sunday um, for lunch. Um, and uh, it's going to be quite cold. So um, particularly at night, there is going to be the heated shop. And Matt and I are talking about... Uh, what we can do to make it so that people can bed down in the shop if that makes sense um, but you know don't take it lightly bring extra stuff um, and I will be doing a carving demo I've got this tiny little sliver of wood here I'm trying to clean up I'll be doing a carving demo on both days at two o'clock so um, you know, show up by then. I think that's the only scheduled thing, or don't show up by then. It doesn't matter to me if you're there or not. Uh, that's the only thing that's like on the schedule. The rest of it is just hanging out and carving together and getting to know each other. So I'm really looking forward to it. Hope you guys are looking forward to it as well. I. Uh, oh, you're Ruth. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> glad to hear it. I'm glad you find it fascinating. Um, so I was burnishing with a ceramic pestle, Mike. That was Mike that was saying, yeah. And uh, but the but the glazed portion on the side, for whatever reason, it doesn't burnish quite as well. Um, like I could use it to do this, but it just doesn't have quite the same effect. So I'm using a bit of antler that's been sanded down to 3,000 grit to burnish all of the non bowl surfaces and particularly these ends here you'll you'll really feel because a lot of times we hold the spoon right at the end and if you don't burnish these little bits it'll just feel sharp on your hand um, and I'm really pressing quite hard particularly on the end here like you want it to look uh, polished so and at the same time burnishing gives you a sense of you know where imperfections are so for instance there's one little spot where there's one wood hair sticking up right there now your chance to go back and get those cleaned up without opening a can of worms without going back and trying to make everything perfect it's just about doing what's expedient in the moment to then be done. Okay, almost at the end of this tin of wax. This tin of wax lasts me, I think this one lasted me maybe 15 spoons. I don't know, it's been a 
normal week. I think I started it at the beginning of the week. Um, all right. Another question that just came in. Yeah, Burnish cherry is beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah, I really love it. Um, so. Let's carry on. feeling for any dry areas. Uh, I think it's important to keep smoothing this around to the dry areas in terms of how um, smooth it feels at the end. If I didn't smooth the extra around, then the areas that dried out first would get rougher. I don't quite understand why, why they would feel rough and then be smooth, but it must have something to do with the wood fibers. Um, question there. Uh, I don't make brooms. No, those are just from the local hardware store. Do I ever make other industrial goods? Um, I, I buy notebooks and I I do know canvas and leather making from my time working on sailing ships, but I found that there is relatively little interest in those. Um, they, they don't have the same place in people's lives as, as cooking spoons. Um, so you like this trick now over the heat, but that thing so hot how am i holding it um <laughs> it does get hot it gets it gets quite hot um yeah you just kind of get used to it i think matt uh it's uh yeah sometimes it's too hot for me to hold and uh, you'll see me doing hot potato with it but um yeah um okay i'll wipe this down and then i'll put it down next to the other spoons I carved today. Um, <laughs> I wish my calluses from ships uh, were, uh, were still around. I had some crazy calluses when I was on sailing ships. Like my, my palms were just ridiculous. Now I have a ridiculous callus right here, but other than that, uh, and one the smaller one right here, other than that, I don't have much. So, um, do I ever think about making whittling knives? If you mean like like craft knives, no. I'm not a metal worker, and I don't have a shop that I can I can do that sort of stuff with. Uh, it's been really fun collaborating, if that's the right word, with with my friend Matt Temple Mountain Woodcraft on the, the knives that he does. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys. Uh, hold on, let me raise this up. Okay, I just thought since I have these here. So these are the things I've made this morning. Uh, here's the eating spoon I made this morning. Really liking the tail flip on this. Let's see if I can pull back a little bit so you can see the profile there. Um, and then the pot scraper has an indentation on either side. The idea is that you can hold it like that and really get in at stuff. This has a, an edge that has is been left sharp and I try and make it as flat as possible so you can actually scrape stuff with it. Here's my simple spatula. Uh, it has a nice crank to it and it gets, basically it's at its widest point all throughout here and then it has a, a, a taper that is consistent right to here and then there's a little bevel that goes across. Um, but there's that. And I also started making the sides on this a little bit curved so that if you're uh, scraping the side of a mixing bowl with it that it conforms to the curve of the bowl a little bit better. Um, and then here is the pocket spoon. And for the rest of the day I gotta give a final read to a manuscript and then I'm going up the slope to go harvest some wood to make uh, clubs with so that I'm ready for my... Um... Everything okay? No, oh, we're good. Um, so I'm ready for my um, 
first class of the season. Good. Um, uh, is wax is better than oiling? Um, you know, what to use for, for oiling something is, is really has to do with what you are hoping to achieve with it. Uh, I use this Yoyoba oil beeswax mixture um, basically because I like that it doesn't stain the, uh, the wood yellow. And uh... okay, guys, thanks so much. I think that's it.